Well, good morning again, everybody. I hope you've um, enjoyed the morning tea break. It's my pleasure now to announce our second plenary session speaker this morning. Professor Lotz Beckett is the head of the Department of Medicine at the University of Otago in New Zealand. He's also a respiratory physician at the Canterbury District Health Board with particular clinical interest in interstitial lung disease, pulmonary vascular disease, and respiratory physiology and asthma. I did have a longer bio, but uh, Lotz has requested that I go straight to the point. And um, I will announce now that he did it, um, inform me last night with his feats of endurance being a marathon runner and also a coast to coast runner in New Zealand. For those people who know the coast to coast, it's a very tough endurance run from the west coast to the east coast. So he, he's a man of many talents, as we're about to hear about. So welcome, Lots. Thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you very much for, uh, for inviting me. It's a great, it's a great honor. Then, tene kote katoa, ko Elbe te awa, no Germany te whenua e takutumura punua e te tu 1998 kihare o te e otorua, ko Lutzbeka taku ingua, tene kota, tene kota, tene kota katoa. And basically, this is just an acknowledgement that I'm now sort of an honorary New Zealander. However, I, I have said that I have initially came from Germany. My hometown, is in the no uh, my hometown is in the north of Germany, Hamburg, and a part of, uh, a part of the Mihi Mi is to point out the mighty river Elbe. And at some stage, I took one of the walkers, probably not this one, because uh, as the advertising gives away, I actually took his boring 777, and ended up in Air Tauroa. Now, I'm based in the, the South Island of New Zealand, in Christchurch, and we talked uh, with somebody about the little French settlements in Akaroa. Prior to the French settling there, the Maori, this was a very important cultural site for the Maori, for our local Maori, the Naitahu. And this is Onukumarai, where we take each year the whole class of medical students for three days as part of the immersed, immersed learning for indigenous health. And indigenous people often carry a particular, a, particular disease, a particular disease burden. So you now know two of the things about me. One, they're explaining my rather strange New Zealand accent. <laughs> and, the, and the other one, that I'm currently living, in, living and working in New Zealand. There's one th third thing I come to just in a moment. And, uh, the topic today I've been asked to talk about is a beautiful study, quite an honor to present, about asthma throughout Australia and the Asia-Pacific region. You will find that the information is far less detailed than what we know about, for example, the UK situation. Uh, it's, a, it's one of the largest areas population and very little, uh, and very little is known. But what is known, I'd like, like to share with you. Then we comment, I comment on some areas of barriers of asthma control and just have some of my sort of a, a personal selection of some ideas what I think we could work on to improve asthma control. The bit which I hadn't told you about myself is that I spent much of my time uh, uh, talking with medical students. And I long learned that medical students are not particularly interested in what I have to say and most medical students actually have a considerable knowledge of what's going on. And uh, my talk is timed the way, this slide will come up three times, uh, that I would ask you in, in the first one um, to uh, spend a minute or two, ideally with somebody you haven't met, but now you're sitting on these, on these lovely tables, which is such a great way to, uh, great way to communicate. Just spend a minute or two to uh, go as a theme as a conference, connect on asthma care. Uh, you, will have, you just heard one talk about, how shall we say, opportunities for improvement, and there will be more opportunities of improvements, which I will point out. 
However, most of you spend a long time and a lot of energy to improve asthma care, and many of us also have some treatment successes. So my challenge to you is to spend a minute to connect ideally with a new person and share, uh, and, and share a story on actually looking backwards, this aspect of asthma care went really well. My challenge is to be quiet for minutes, so I give you a chance to actually connect. That's what I feel the conference is about. So, uh, does anybody does anybody wish to share? Is there anything you share? Anything? Any story you uh, wish to share, uh, which is, which you can shout out? Anything particularly successful? I'm used to this uh, to medical student, but uh, 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 there will be another opportunity. Uh, will be another opportunity. Um, Let's go back to the slides and let's look at some data. So the study which I focus mainly on is, has been already been peer-reviewed, published. The main author is Phil Thompson, the, uh, for a long time our senior editor of the journal Respirology, which really has been making great progress. And it's about insights, attitude, perceptions about asthma and its, and its treatments. And it has compared eight different countries in the Asia-Pacific Asia -Pacific region, including Australia and Hong Kong. And one of, the, uh, one of the aspects the authors reflect on is, well, which countries did we, did we choose? There is not a perfect study. They did not have an unlimited budget. And they do reflect that although it's, it has 31% of the world population, uh, they only picked on eight countries. And for example, for pragmatic and financial reasons, big areas like Philippines, Pakistan, Japan are not part of the survey. I think it is probably looking at what, uh, what, what else is happening in the world economically and with IT developments. It is, may well be an area which will revolutionize asthma care and sort of as, a soci as societies, it is exciting to, have, to be sort of part of this process. And it is also likely that asthma care is influenced by all sorts of things, which uh, access to health service, availability of medications, training and attitudes of health professionals, and also cultural attitudes. However, before we make any impact, we need data. And this is the attempt to get a bit of data. This was a population-based study, essentially a survey, and it was done mainly by, uh, by random digital telephone dialing. And if you can imagine, once you answered your telephone, and uh, I'll come back to, uh, back to the next slide, and the researcher spoke to you, he only had asked 53 questions. Would you mind asking 53 questions? <laughs> As we notice a bit later, we would wish they would have asked 500, would have asked 530 questions when somebody answered the phone, because there's so much at the end we feel we would love to know. Just a quick look to the demographics. So these were the, uh, 
Good. These were the countries. Uh, these were the country surveys, and uh, and my, it was hard work. So, if you, for example, were, uh, were a researcher in China with a low asthma prevalence, you had to call a lot of households to find people eligible, and then sort of they had quite a good particip participation rate. Now, in Australia and New Zealand, would be very much the same as a higher prevalent of a prevalence of asthma. They found host households which are eligible, and then about half the people hung the phone up. And I think in another survey, which uh, Messi is coming along, we've basically given up on telephone surveys. So it would have been much nicer to be have a survey in Taiwan or Thailand, where people are far more polite, and they do actually do speak to people. And so uh, at the end, uh, you ended up with about, about a, 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 a sample of about 400 people per person. And quite impressive, India, Malaysia, and Thailand, I think it was, did very well of uh, diagnosing asthma quite quickly, only year difference between onset of symptoms and diagnosis. The next slide is one of several which I show you, and I'll keep it up for a little while because they are quite busy slides. Um, first, to get used to the color combination, whenever you see a slide like this, the blue one is the overall for the Asia-Pacific region, and the other countries are color-coordinated. So the first slide is the, is the representation of the questions on the telephone. The te uh, how do you have daily, uh, what daytime symptoms do you have? Overall, 23 quarter of all people report daily symptoms. Half of all people report symptoms per week, and then some people in another quarter have symptoms only once per month, and this varies. Australia and uh, uh, India report a lot of daily symptoms. China and Thailand report lots of weekly symptoms. Probably nothing too new in there, just highlighting a quite a significant burden of asthma. That is, a, uh, is the same montage, this time talking about nighttime symptoms. Overall, 20% of people in the Asia Pacific region report nighttime symptoms uh, uh, every night. In particular, again, India and Australia. And about half, people, half of the people surveyed have nighttime symptoms on a weekly basis. Again, China and South Korea are particularly high. And that sort of vaguely reflects what we know about asthma. And the next question is interesting. And it's probably not all that new because it has been, discuss has been discussed a few times. But as the researcher was on the telephone, he was asking the patient a bit like we do, how is your asthma going? Is everything is fine? Or here yeah, I'm back from my repeating for scream, but how is asthma? It's great. Is the asthma well controlled? Yes. So if you ask the global question, and that's quite, uh, that was quite revealing, more than half the people felt the asthma was well controlled. Particular sort of, uh, particular Taiwan, Hong Kong, China, Australia, people were actually quite happy with their asthma control. <laughs> the next slide, I'm pleased that uh, we agree on this. Peter has already, uh, sh already shown. I, I really quite like the sim simplicity of it. We could also use the asthma control test. It's only five questions and gives you a number at the end. So as numbers are often quite nice to communicate with. I quite like these, uh, I quite like these GINA questions. They're very easy to integrate in a normal clinical consultation. So your asthma is fine, isn't it? Yes, I only need my, use to my inhaler once or twice per day. And nighttime symptoms, no problems with nighttime symptoms. What do you mean? Oh, the asthma inhaler is just by the bed. I use it only once per night. So you get, the, you get these, symptoms, these answers be, uh, answers very, uh, very quickly. So I think Gina has done a great job summarizing this into four questions only. And these four questions were also integrated into the 53 questions people asked during the telephone interview. And if you accept the classification that well-controlled asthma should have none, none of these problems, and uh, also what is accept the qualification of partially controlled and uncontrolled asthma, it looks quite different. This is the same montage, and you have to look quite carefully. 2% in the Asia Pacific region have well controlled questions, if you are well controlled asthma, if you asked the GINA, four GINA questions. Singapore, Australia, and Hong Kong are doing all right. India is particular, India, China, particular high burden of asthma. 
So these are the ones, according to the Gina criteria, who have poorly controlled asthma. Not, her asthma is not well controlled. And I put the same information again, because it's quite relevant information on the same slide. So if you ask people, how, what do you think about your asthma, you get an answer, it's all right, mate. If you ask sort of just two or three more questions, you get quite a different picture. And the next two slides are really just validating questions. So asking the question, well, a lot of kudos, Regina. Four questions, you get it right. Uh, I think we should move forward. But this one is really, is Gina, uh, this one is really asking the question, is Gina right? Do people actually have poorly controlled asthma? And on the top here is the number of people who report an asthma exasperation in the last 12 months. And you can see, again, a high burden of asthma. Many people report asthma exasperation over the last 12 months. And if you ask exasperation, the question is, how long did it last for? And this is the, uh, uh, this is the mean, this is the medium number of days. So overall, four to five days. But many, uh, some people really have, uh, had have quite long asthma exacerbation, asthma exacerbation, hence the long medium numbers, a significant burden of disease. And the next slide is so rep you reported asthma exacerbations, but did you actually need to take days off school or days uh, days off work? Sixty six percent of the people surveyed needed to take off days of school. The biggest impact is in India. 10 days, uh, 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 78 of people needed to take, or take days of school or work, an average of 10 days. Uh, Austra uh, Australia, Singapore, Taiwan, Thailand, significant disease burden. And underneath is quite an interesting question. I haven't actually come across this yet, uh, but the uh, researchers are also asked, look, you have asthma, when your asthma is well controlled, how productive do you think you are? How good do you study? How good do you work? And people report, self-reported, if the asthma was well controlled, they probably function sort of 80% what they feel, they, where they feel how they should be working. However, on these, when they have an asthma exacerbation, asthma is not, early control, uh, not well controlled, it essentially halves. It might not, be, it might not be bad enough to take a day of work or day of school, but they feel they just can't concentrate and they just uh, do, uh, do, are not as productive at, at work as they should be. And I just pause here just for just one moment uh, to give sort of Gina the kudos for these four questions, to, uh, to get ask four simple questions, get this level of information. I think the uh, data assessing disease burden, the days of school, the days of loss of productivities, the number of asthma exacerbations validate that the Gina questions are probably right, better or give us more information than the global question. And then also, uh, also uh, sort of the challenge of us to us, we have actually very good guidelines, we have very, very good evidence base. Most people could be controlled with a medium to high dose of inhaled or low dose of inhaled corticosteroids. Uh, what, uh, uh, what's, what's happening? And I, I tell you, uh, I, I show you on this, uh, show you on the next slide what people are actually doing. Again, a slightly busy slide, and I'll break the after for you to have another quick discussion. But I let me go through the slide. So this is asking questions. So in the last week, have you been taking a rescue medicine, like a ventral inhaler? 72% overall of people reported the use of rescue medication. And then you see the breakdown. That's Australia. That's India. That's uh, Singapore. And at the end, in alphabetical order, that's Thailand. And then also, in the last week, did you take controller medication? And this is self-reported, but the answer is two, two, almost two-thirds of people reported they take controller medication for their asthma. Uh, the highest is incidentally India, uh, Australia, and China. And then the follow-up question was, well, you said you took controller medication the last week. What sort of controller medication did you take? 
And this slide took actually it took me some time to get my mind around it, and I may need some help from the audience. But so 80% of people who said they were taking controller medication said they were taking a tablet. 80% of people. Australia is so it's really quite not very few people in Australia take controller uh, take a tablet, whereas 86 percent of people in China and 87 uh, percent of people in North uh, in South Korea take a tablet. And tablets uh, for these uh, for these populations were, were prednisone. Uh, jumping over here, Australia uh, uh, who had an, who took an steroid inhaler, well. Uh, Australia matches the low number of prednisone prescribing and the high number of prednisone inhalers, and also Singapore, very high number of inhaled corticosteroids. Altogether, uh, the low number, or t uh, sort of an average of 30% of people are taking an inhaled steroid in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, these people take nebulizers, and I think in China and also in Hong Kong, uh, there are, uh, uh, you can nebulize steroids, which we don't do very often, or I don't at all. So I think they take inhaled steroids, but I think the real contrast is in these graphs that a large proportion, pop, uh, large numbers of populations taking tablets, steroids, t uh, as prednisone to control the asthma. So. The next question is uh, another chance, because uh, you've, as I alluded to start with, I've got a little more information, one more slide from the survey, but the research has only asked 53 questions and not 530, so I would love to have known more. But uh, the next question really is back to you again. So you've already broken, you have broken the ice once, but uh, the survey tried to explore what are the barriers of asthma control. So if we have fantastic evidence base, we have good guidelines, we know how we have to control asthma, and we, show, we have shown that's a huge burden of disease. So uh, have a think, what, is the, what are the uh, barriers of control for these countries, or also in your own communities, because I know you're we, we all struggling with this. What do you think is sort of the biggest barrier which stops us treating patients the way or to, uh, to, they, they should be, uh, we, we should be treating them, because we have good evidence base and good guidelines. So you've got another two minutes. Okay, that's done. That's all right. You get one more chance in the moment, but is, does anybody uh, 
want to have a guess what, are, what, came, what came out uh, uh, as the biggest barrier on asthma control? Yep. Yeah, no, it's... Uh, they don't understand it, don't accept it. Yes. Also shown in the UK surveys, oh, it's a bit of mild asthma, don't worry about it. It's sort of this, uh, don't want to give bad news, don't want to accept there's something which I need to address and then can address. Any other idea? Cost, cost, cost of medication, yes. Yeah, a consistent, a consistent message, yeah. yeah. Uh, some of this comes out in the survey. It's actually quite interesting. So on the top, it's just, uh, I just mentioned it quickly because the slide is here. On the top is asking across, uh, uh, across the population, people actually accept a large degree of poorly controlled asthma. They just feel if you have asthma, yes, it's normal to need to, to use the controller medication. If you have asthma, of course, you have the symptoms during the, during the day, during the night. And if you have asthma, of course, you get exasperation. So a general low expectation of us put it like, uh, can turn it around. But this I found very interesting. So 65% uh, throughout the, uh, throughout the Asia-Pacific region, in particular 72% in India, 62% in China, 57% of people in Malaysia report that the fear of asthma exasperation keeps myself or keeps my child from doing things I want to do, a particular uh, sports or a sport would be in here. That is very interesting. Uh, people worry about the side effects of oral steroids Particular in, uh, particular in Taiwan, a great fear of side effects of oral steroids, but quite rightly, Australia, China, everybody has concerns about oral prednisone. The last graph, I think, is, uh, is, uh, is an area, so there's a lack of, uh, where, where we uh, have a lack of sending a consistent message, because uh, throughout the board, the fear of inhaled oral steroids is just as high as the fear of oral steroids. And it reflects the low usage and the, uh, uh, reflects the us usage in the countries as we have seen earlier. So quite, uh, quite impressively, a, um, uh, a, a very high degree of, uh, this is the, the fear of side effects was the biggest, was the largest identified burden to, uh, for asthma care. And the survey did explore a little bit about cost. I'm sure cost is an issue, but when, when given the chance, only being asked one question, it's a limited survey, only 53 questions, and when asked only one question, uh, the cost didn't come out as one of the major, uh, one of the major problems. Mo many of the asthma care medications are now off, off patent, so I'm not, I'm, I had some informal discussion about prices, but the cost of inhaled corticosteroids that is not a major issue. Supply is, prescribing is, and the biggest barrier and identified was probably inhaled corticosteroids. Now, I have them hidden, the slides. I won't go through the slides. A similar survey was done 10 years earlier. Slides are in a different format, and also different countries were identified. However, there is a good news in there that the uh, amount of inhaled corticosteroids used increased from 13% in the year 2000, when the survey was done for the first time, to 30% in 2011 when the survey was done the second time. However, a 30% use of inhaled corticosteroids is still a rather low number of inhaled corticosteroids, a rather low number of inhaled corticosteroid use. That's probably as much information as this survey gives us. A high, a high burden of, a high, come to this, a high burden of disease, a high disease burden, um, a large disparity of taking medication and a very high dose of a very high dose of steroid use. The next slide, you know, some of you might have just had a glimpse of it, is really sort of uh, just using the opportunity of the room. You've now, you all actually know this information. As, uh, it is good to have the real data, and it's a wonderful study which needed to be presented, but we know there is a gap. 
we know that we have good evidence base, we have clear guidelines, and somehow we won't get anywhere. I just spent some time over the last week, I had the opportunity to talk to Peter Barnes. Peter Barnes' summary was that the, the main reason for steroid, steroid resistant asthma is that the patients are resistant to take steroids. So that's another, uh, it's another way to put it. Uh, that's sort of this networking opportunity of the, on the conference, and, it's about, and the theme is about connecting asthma care. It sort of just starts as thinking out, uh, outside the square. And I see uh, uh, there's some fantastic present presentations coming up this afternoon and also tomorrow afternoon. I'll be looking forward to people's ideas. In order to free the thinking, I thought I might ask the question the other way around. That is the last chance that you, uh, that, uh, that's the last chance to get to talk, but do, ha uh, do, have so, uh, do have some fun with this question. Put yourself in a, situ a, connect a different situation, connect to your dark side. After being good all day and having to help people, think about what could you do if, you, if your task would be what could I do to really worsen asthma control in my, in my community or for my patient? What is the one thing I could do to make asthma control actually worse? And I get great, uh, this is probably inspired that I, from, uh, from our uh, from family life that we have sort of teenage, that our children have been explained, but uh, our lovely children have been exchanged to teenagers, so reverse psychology is the only thing which helps. But I get so fascinating answers from medical students, so I stick with this question. So connect to your dark side and have, a, have some fun. What can you do to make asthma worse? Right. So normally I get some great ideas. I'm looking for some new ideas. Uh, any ideas on how to reverse an asthma control? Just shout out a few brilliant ideas you had. Yes? Oh, get ideas from the anti-vaccination lobby, yes. Uh, any other ideas? <laughs> how to make asthma worse? Send, uh, get rid of the medications, yes, yes. Excellent. We decided to make Ventolin free. Well, great idea. <laughs> freely available <laughs> freely Ventolin. <laughs> yes? Yes, uh, smoking is very, uh, it's a great way to, uh, to encourage asthma. And, uh, that's a great idea. 
Good. I'm, I'm pleased about this. I hope it doesn't make any press releases, but I'm very, I'm very, I'm very pleased about this. And really, it's uh, at the end of the talk, uh, so we had several discussions about this, and, that, uh, and your, your smoking point uh, is uh, really one of my first points as well. If I then randomly think about sort of what, is, what, what, what are my ideas, looking at the literature, and I have, the, I have the honor to be asked to share my ideas, what would I pick on, and I would stick in the first bit, and I only put one slide up. It is, it is talking to converted. It is a constant message for every health professional. We cannot talk about controlling asthma when 50% of a population continue to smoke. Is, and we need to be very clear about this. I like the uh, WHO empower sort of framework, and 180 countries have signed up for the framework convention, so it should give any health profession, any country, sort of a, an angle to work from. I'm very lucky to be uh, 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 working in New Zealand, and New Zealand has signed a charter of uh, aiming to be virtually smoke-free by 2025. Currently, Australia is actually beating us. You have a slightly lower general smoking rate, but that, that's a great competition to have. One little bit for countries and uh, for people who uh, live in Australia and New Zealand. It's great now that our hospitals are smoke free. You don't have to have a debate. You can't smoke here. Can I help you in any way with your nicotine craving? A, a wee trap is this one. If you see people about, uh, for other issues and you know you're smoking and, they're not and you're not addressing it, People expect nowadays to be nagged about the smoking. So if you get tired of nagging them, they go home and say, I went to see the doctor and she didn't say anything about my smoking, so it can't be too bad. So uh, we need to keep this message up. Raising taxes is probably the most effective way on controlling smoking. But this needs to be a consistent message, and I put it on the top. The next one is probably more of a personal choice. But I, and I've, I must say, I've actually taken it in retrospect from the National, uh, uh, National Asthma Council handbook, but I've used this quote so often that I now consider it to be mine, but I find it silly to manage, to manage the blood pressure without a sphygmometer, just to write in the piles. It's very silly to manage diabetes by just testing the urine, how much sugar is in there. It's much better to have a glucometer, and I really do want a spirometer, or at least a peak chromometer, to manage asthma. And it doesn't matter whether you have a system where you supply people, uh, people who uh, like GPs with spirometry, or whether you perform spirometry in the community. The second one is, uh, uh, is, some, uh, is something we've done locally. Actually, it turns out to be a little bit more expensive and a bit slower, but it doesn't matter. But I think spirometry, having objective data when managing asthma, is important, and I very much like the, uh, uh, the diagram on, on, from Gina. Quite simple pr medical principle. The patient comes with you to you with symptoms. You take a history. You do a measurement, the measurement is spirometry, you think about the measurement, and then you treat accordingly. And thinking about the measurement in other settings, we spend whole conferences thinking about the measurements and what is the right one to do and how to perform it and what are the right quality criteria and what to do if it's, uh, what, which ones are false positives and which ones are false negatives. But the principle is correct, and I quite like this very straightforward uh, Gina, flow, uh, Gina flow chart. So no, no, doubt about, uh, no doubt about smoking cessation, and people should have access to spirometry. On the uh, Asia-Pacific survey, which I just reviewed, only half, just only half of the population, not half the people, had their asthma diagnosed with asthma, a very low rate in India, Malaysia, Thailand, and Hong Kong. And uh, South Korea is beating Australia, but it's still a, a quarter of people have a, a diagnosis of asthma, never had lung functions performed. There is still room for improvement in there. And the next bit, and I think we're on a similar, a similar wavelength there, is, uh, is, my, uh, my think, is my thinking about salbutamol. And possibly uh, sort of my plea, maybe something as a society we should, uh, we should um, lobby for it. So this study, uh, you, may, you probably have seen, 
It's one of Richard's, uh, Richard's thesis papers and is published uh, last year in Lance and Resp Respiratory Medicine. And it's one of the papers where he shows that he can control moderately severe asthma. And he actually picked uh, patients with a risk of a severe asthma exacerbation. These were people in GP practice, people who were in hospital with asthma before, people who continued to smoke. And he gave them a combination inhaler, ephemoterol and uh, budenoside, and told them, take this inhaler twice a day in addition, take Take it when you, feel unwell, when you feel unwell. And he wasn't the first one who published that you can control asthma this way. He had uh, independent funding for his study. But I just wanted to highlight one aspect of the study, because the other group had just, uh, the other group has just the same medication. The only thing different they had was, here's your uh, red inhaler, and take, it, uh, take two parts twice daily. And in addition, I give you a blue inhaler, which you can take when you feel short of breath. So the only difference between these two groups were that this group down here, whose exacerbation rate almost doubled within not quite a year, had, uh, had a actually subutamol inhaler available. There's a lot more data coming out there because each single patient had a Nexus 6 ship with this inhaler. So Richard has already published follow-up data what people actually do with their inhaler. So we've got some beautiful data coming out there. But a lovely, uh, a lovely sort of signal what happens if you give people subutamol. And when I arrived in New Zealand, I just arrived in a, at a sort of really high rate of the, uh, debate. And, uh, uh, one or two people from, or from New Zealand and, my, uh, and the country may remember this, but it was a very fierceful debate, the beta agonist debate, the phenotero story. And I think it's quite lovely summarized in this one cartoon by Penn. This was very nicely done. Uh, that one medication, uh, i.e. subutamol, a beta-2 agonist, can do something very nice by relaxing your smooth muscles. And at the same time, the same medication which uh, stops you wheezing because it relaxes the smooth muscles can also increase airway inflammation, inf uh, increase sputum production, and increase airway irritation. And I think that's actually quite a nice way to put things together into, uh, uh, into, one, single into one single cartoon. And if we know all this, and if we also know that most of our people with asthma are controlled on a low dose inhaled corticosteroids, I feel we may have been a bit remissant to not make a bit more out of this paper. This is now almost 10 years old. This is done by, uh, that's done by Papi. I think many of us know this paper. It was the, uh, it was the first time it's done. It has, been repeated, it has been repeated. But he had people with mild asthma. And mild asthma is important because he just repeated it with moderate severe asthma and it doesn't work. But mild asthma is important. And he gave people with mild asthma a combination inhaler of beclomethazone and subutamol and one inhaler. The beauty of this is that both medications are off patent. And some of the countries in Asia Pacific regions are the countries which are the largest producers of generic medications. And so these, uh, these people have been told, here's your one inhaler, and take it whenever you need it. And they're not really talking about asthma control. They're talking about excess operation rates. But nevertheless, they're doing really well. And this is taking subutamol beclomethazone on a PRM basis. This is your group, the people who only had subutamol. There, that is really the worst you can do. But we encouraging that you can control, uh, seem to be able to control asthma with a one sim a simple combination inhaler of patent medications uh, and uh, very simple instructions. And the last bit, and I think is uh, just my personal take on it, and that's uh, very much within the, theme, within the theme of the conference, is really do get our community involved. There are fantastic examples in here on, how to, uh, on the conference, how to induce, uh, introduce communities. Uh, and I'll just very quickly comment on two. This one I liked as an American study published in 2015. This one I liked as a small randomized control trial. But what they did they used in the intervention group, they trained people out of the community, the Kamatua, or supposedly the woman who actually runs the Marai, or somebody uh, in the block of flats, or the sports person, or somebody from uh, 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 Surf Life Saving Club, to actually uh, train, uh, get a fortnight training what asthma is about, and then fortnightly follow up. 
and also train to motivation interviewing, and then they get a case load of 40, 50 clients, which they should meet four to five times per year. When they see these clients, of course they talk about asthma, talk about asthma pathophysiology, talk about medication use, interesting how to talk to doctors, uh, about flu vaccination, but they also do lots of other useful things. And it is not surprising that this group really does much better controlling asthma. The asthma-free days doubled from three to six, quality of life is improved, and also sort of urgent healthcare utilization basically halved. So that is great news. Uh, any guess what this would cost per patient if you were to run this service, which I thought was the most exciting part of the study? That's about $1,300 a year, which in the States is less than the cost of one, one hysteroid prescription, and for us in New Zealand is less than the cost of one sort of combination product prescription per year. And I thought it was actually quite cost effective. The last one, and I just mentioned two or three, uh, two or three slides to it because I think Smita has, I would presume Smita had presented before. I haven't seen her, so, but she might even be here. But this is now an oldish paper, but I just love it because we know that it's hard to talk to teenagers. We know that teenagers more, listen more to their peers than to their parents. And so she came up with a model, and this is part of a randomized, cluster randomized controlled trials where she had three schools in the community. You've done this in three schools who haven't. But the schools who were, the schools who were enrolled um, uh, had, a training, had a training program that volunteer year 11 students were told about asthma and pathophysiology. They, uh, they run workshops on it using games, videos, and worksheets. They went on to train year 10 students who then used drama and songs and acts to bring the as asthma message across to the year, uh, year 7 students. And you can just see the energy, and we also see this in our sessions on the Marae, and uh, it is quite amazing. Significant improvement in emotional health, in symptoms, more chance of participative activities, and also, this is a slightly different montage, the uh, schools which have parti participated in the intervention are the, uh, uh, did much, uh, had far less, uh, fewer days of school, and also significantly less asthma exasperation. So I think several of you sort of presenting similar things to just sort of engage the communities, harvest this energy out there, uh, and uh, hopefully this is a way forward on how we sort of gain a bit of traction to get our asthma message across. So thank you for listening. So I went through a set, set of data, the few information we have from the Asia-Pacific region. We reflected on some of the main barriers which didn't appear to be caused. And then I shared four ideas with you, which I would, which I would focus on in asthma control, smoking cessation, spirometry, reduce subutamol use, and invest in our communities. So thank you for, for talking and sharing, and hopefully we can continue this. I'm looking forward to more ideas on how to make asthma worse at lunchtime. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank Lotz very much for his presentation. It's obviously when we, we look around at other countries around the world, look at what's working and not working in those locations, and try and bring those, those messages home for ourselves that we can really learn something. So thank you very much to, to Lotz for his presentation. I'd just like to um, give you the small gift. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you.